So thank, thanks everyone for coming. So what I wanted to share with you today is practical reinforcements for stock trading. Um, I guess what, what we need to discuss is what's actually the difference between institutional and non-institutional stock trading, because there's a lot of um, some YouTube clips or, or <clears throat> presentations, interviews about some stock trading bots with re reinforcement learning and showcasing how they achieve some great returns where you sit back and you get the money passively. Uh, in reality, this is, this is really not possible uh, unless you are at some huge hedge fund with 100 quants that work day and night on optimizing this software and making it uh, making it work, executing trades for you automatically. You heard about those quant hedge funds, high frequency trading, et cetera, et cetera. This is just not reasonable for uh, non-institutional investors or, or private investors that just don't have that much time. So <clears throat> what I want to share with you now, because as, as Professor Gerard already mentioned, um, the, the, this, this is just um, continuous work that I did based upon my master thesis, where I um, try to actually enhance this bot, but what we'll see, it, it's actually an artificial analyst that can parse this information for me. But what I quickly learned as, as I was building this, as I was trying to learn more about it, is that this is not really about picking individual stocks. Um, we cannot, as, as, as I said, we cannot, if you are not a huge quant hedge fund, train this bot to do this for us. Uh, it's just not reasonable or possible. This is a pipe dream. The reason for that is that there's just too much information, information to process. You cannot do it either with a bot or on yourself. Uh, it's the, the sea of, of tabular uh, text, uh, uh, et cetera, information that you need to process is just too big. And the question that I asked is, can we automate the information processing with math and computers? Yeah, um, as I said, yes, we can, but it's not what you think in the sense of there is not some passive bot that trades for you. You can build an assistant that can help you do this. And as I was building this, and as I thought about sharing it maybe with my colleagues at, at the university, I also wanted to, to show what's possible with this. So the, as I said, I've been working on this uh, robot for, for now it's almost like two years. And uh, as, as I back tested it and I saw it work, um, me and a couple of my friends, we pulled together money and um, we wanted to actually <clears throat> see, even with back testing, even when we made sure that it actually makes money, we wanted to invest our own money and see if we could earn something. Now, I explicitly wanted to show you one screenshot where there's a huge loss on options trading on that day. Uh, just to show you that this is not a perfect scenario where it's like, uh, you get you get rich every day and you, you get a lot of money and it works all perfectly. Like this is definitely a volatile system that can lose you money. And as I said, this is pool money. So this is like a couple of my friends, we invest a couple of thousand and, and, and we just saw how it performs. And over the time, right? So over the last six months, on average, we did earn money, but there were definitely days that we lost a lot of money. Now you're wondering if this is not a bot that trades on its own, uh, how does this then work? Like, how do you use this artificial intelligence to, to actually train and, and help you um, parse this information and, and make the trades? Um, and you guessed it, the, the huge part behind it is mathematics. And we will come to that, but before we even go through this, what I also want to mention is that this is not this is not for this is not the, the optimal way for non-institutional investors. The, maybe the safest way, if we look at from risk perspective, would be something like index funds. So uh, financial instruments just just measures some index. So in this uh, example. It's a Vanguard tech index, so it measures 500 biggest companies um, around the world, software companies. So think about Google's and Apple's of the world, and it just measures and it tries to track their, their behavior and uh, tries to replicate it. 
So what you see here is that if you invested 10,000 in 2011, by the end of uh, 2021, uh, in 10 years span, you would have gained almost $65,000. Uh, so I guess this, this, is, this really showcases that maybe on the average, when you don't want to invest a lot of time in this, just following an index and, and investing in a broad sector is pro probably the best way to go because you minimize the risk. You're not thinking about some options because as we know, um, put options, for example, strictly theoretically, uh, you can lose infinitely infinite amount of money. So there's a lot of risk involved if you not, don't know what you're doing. Um, now, uh, the other side of the coin that we also have to discuss is, is index just a way not to do your homework, right? So does this mean that if I'm too lazy and I don't want to think about this and try to parse this information and build some hypotheses and models, is this a, just a lazy way to, to invest? But <clears throat> the other question that can also be posed is, can this homework this research and parsing of the data can be done by applying math? And the answer is obvious. Yes, it can, because reinforcement learning is just math, and we will see what I'm talking about. Um, um, as I said, this um, reinforcement learning bot that I made is not automatic. So this bot works as an analyst. So think about someone, some financial analyst that actually works in big institutions and uh, makes reports, makes some aggregation of data and presents you with these ag aggregations. This can also be achieved with this reinforcement learning bot. And he can find and suggest you potential arbitrage opportunities that you can then uh, trade upon. But this is, this is a very important word, potential. Because as you saw from the two slides above, the day we, we lost a lot of money. It's not that the bot traded on these days. He found the arbitrage opportunities in, in these Tesla options. And he said, he made an indicator that said, you should probably look into it deeper, do your own analysis, and then potentially trade upon this. But this is a really cr crucial piece of information because we do not know why did he make this decision? Or how did he make it? So it's not like the, the bot said, yeah, look, look, Elon Musk is tweeting some crazy stuff. You should probably trade upon this. Um, no, the, the reasons for him finding the arbitrage opportunity <coughs> were not explained. Uh, and he just tells us when should we look closer and make our own human judgment upon this. But this is a huge improvement if you think about it, because imagine if you are alone and you have to parse these thousands and thousands of stock information, uh, text information about stock, about the underlying asset, et cetera, et cetera. This is impossible for non-institutional investor. Hence, if you can do it privately with just some automated software and with mathematics, this is a great help. Um, and nevertheless, um, it's super risky because you are, you are relying on a piece of software that you possibly uh, use like a black box to give you some suggestions on how to lose your money. Hence, uh, what we did is we only used options that don't expose you, that don't leverage you, so where you cannot lose an uh, infinite amount of money and that allow you particip participation in the market uh, with very, very low resources, but still big upside. So think about call options, for example. We also use some other complex ones, but sticking to the vanilla ones, right? So you can potentially, you can participate uh, in the market. You can say, um, uh, I, wanna, I wanna buy Tesla options, or Tesla, uh, uh, Tesla options with very low amount of money. And final thought, as I said, it's an information aggregator. This is not automated or the pipe dreams that there are in these various tutorials where there are some agent trading on it. Maybe this exists in these huge quant hedge funds that, that allow someone to do this, but this is just not possible on your own. Um, it's just a black, black box uh, model that you cannot understand all the decisions. Complexity is just too big. But so let's maybe move uh, slowly towards the math part and the reinforcement learning. 
The machine learning field can be broadly categorized, as we see here in the supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. And that could be a broader part of artificial intelligence. And if we look a little bit deeper behind these terms and, and we try to dissect them, we will actually see that this is nothing more than glorified statistics. And um, really, if we look at behind it, supervised learning is really st statistical inference. Uh, reinforcement learning can also be categorized, hence they have these touching points as, as statistics, but also stochastic control theory, uh, as, as, as already noted, we will talk about it, the Bellman equations and then what does, what does this all imply, but really basically behind it to even reason about this, we need formal definitions and a structure behind uh, specifying what is an agent, what is a bot, what, is, what are his possible actions, states, etc., etc., And this is all hidden behind, behind uh, mathematics. And if we take this formal definitions and we implement them simply using software, and we try to automate this decision-making with huge amount of computing power, <clears throat> then we can begin to parse these seas of information that were not possible for humans. Because in 2021, the amount of information that you need to make a decision or to make a conclusion on anything, but let alone stock picking, is just too big for you to parse. We need to automate this. Um, why reinforcement learning? So I'm not going to go in, as in the pre previous slide, what's supervised, what's unsupervised learning. They are all kind of ma machine intelligence and um, they can all be very helpful, but I'm gonna focus on what's reinforcement learning and why, why it helps us in this particular case. First point that I listed is does not require labels. So what does that even mean? Well, basically the supervised learning approach, <clears throat> although it can be very powerful, it requires labels to tell um, this uh, smart machine what predictions are correct or incorrect. This is all often very cumbersome and expensive process that we can just not afford. Um, hence, if we can um, not use this and, and not require labels, it could uh, make things a lot of easier. Um, you can teach it how to learn on its own and improve. This is also a huge factor. So you are really talking about artificial general intelligence. So at least, moving into parts of it. So when you have a smart machine that not only needs um, direction, but it, uh, if you initially give her directions and it learns gradually, slowly, step-by-step step, as it's getting more data, then this really starts to resemble the human uh, loop, the human process. Uh, I would say. So at the beginning, we are babies. We, our parents tell us what we can and cannot do. And then we try on its own uh, to grow up, to iterate uh, trial and error. And we uh, start to optimize our own objective functions in a way, right? So we are all kind of just a, just a machine optimizing for something that's important for us. And like using this uh, analogy, we can also uh, translate it to the machine part where you have uh, the machine that needs to learn at the beginning and that it will uh, optimize its objective uh, objective value. And finally, what's what's also very interesting for me and why why this, this is a powerful approach, it can be creative in ways human can never be. I'm not, there are great analogies for this. I will really leave you with this thought. There's the DeepMind documentary. Uh, I don't know if you saw it. Uh, there, it's on YouTube, but long story short, it showcases uh, how uh, reinforcement learning and the DeepMind algorithms from Google can beat humans in, in Go. That's an ancient game from, from uh, China where it's basically a primal example of human intelligence. And we were beaten uh, by a machine using these reinforcement learning algorithms. What's, what's even more interesting, and that's why I referenced it here, because I would really urge you to look at this is at the beginning of, of this documentary, you can see how when applying reinforcement learning to different problems, it's able to find solutions that us humans could never find. So imagine playing a game of Tetris or, or whatever, and 
the, as, as the machine is learning at the beginning, it's terrible. It can't do anything. But as it's getting more input, it's starting to really learn and not only learn, but beat the humans in ways that we didn't even know it was possible. So just to understand what this creativity even means and how, how it's powerful, I would urge you to maybe look at this documentary and just get a, just get a short um, introduction into this. But it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm, I listed a couple of uh, um, approaches that could be easily translated to the fi financial uh, sector and that, that are uh, hugely valuable there, right? Because you're thinking, I want to automate this. I don't want any labels. I want it to learn on its own and improve. I want it to configure it at the beginning, but not have to work on it day and night. And also, I need it to be super smart and creative the way other humans were were ne never capable of, right? Because that's a potential arbitrage way to beat the market. Um, I guess the contrary question is, if we ask why reinforcement learning, then why not use reinforcement learning? It is very complicated in the sense that when compared with supervised learning, the algorithms are much more complex to define and implement. Um, it's also very expensive in terms of computational resources. Furthermore, uh, down the line, when I tell you about the software implementation of this project, I will explain you how you can enhance this and compute it maybe um, fast. But currently, it's um, yeah. Currently, the current state it's it's very expensive to train these agents because they they require a lot of computing power. And some of the more advanced reinforcement learning methods, like deep reinforcement learning, where they use neural networks, it's often a black box, meaning that you really cannot understand what's happening with these with these algorithms. So think about linear regression. Linear regression can be easily explained because you know it's the unexplained variance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know why some decisions are made, why is this line fitted? But with these deep model, models, it's much, much more complex. And often there are methods, but often it's not explainable. Um, let's go into more details and, and extend on what I said. How did I implement or leverage reinforcement learning to my own artificial financial analyst? Yeah. So the steps that, that I designed at, at the time and that I thought about were is I needed someone to learn in the sea of information what could be the potential arbitrage signals, right? So as I said, it's not about him making the trades or him uh, doing something that I don't understand and losing money, etc. I just need someone to parse this because I cannot read this sea, the terabytes and terabytes of information. What the agent next should do is indicate me the opportunities that I need to make action upon, right? So in the, in, the, in the options market, we are talking about analyzing news, index movement, sentiment on Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of sources of information that could actually indicate if there is a potential uh, arbitrage opportunity there. Furthermore, on step three, I could then zero in, meaning I could uh, look at this indicator of him saying, okay, listen, there is there is uh, some possibility in Tesla options, and then I can do my homework and try to justify the potential trade. And that's the big, big part, right? So the reason why you would lose money and why I lost money is that you you were uh, you had a false positive positive about the arbitrage opportunity because you cannot explain the way he found it, and you made you made the wrong uh, investment at that part. And when the trade is finished, you would either win or lose money first while doing the simulations. But then later on, we would also talk about uh, real time data, so the real trading data. And the, mo the most important part is tweaking the agent to, agent to reinforce the good decision, right? So now, as he made this decision, he saw after the, after the uh, trade, he saw if it was good or bad, he could adjust himself, learn, and um, after learning, um, he could proceed and do other iterations. And you repeat step one in the sense that you want to parse again the information, you let the agent uh, parse it, he gives you some signals, you trade on it, and then depending on was it good or bad, he could learn just like a child, was something a good decision or not. I guess 
now we can jump in slowly into the mathematics part. So I said, learn like a child what's good or bad and what what is the framework that we actually need to to reason about this kind this kind of behavior i guess on the low on, on, on the highest level we can we can think about just some agent some robot if, if you want that makes some action so if you move um, uh, on the on the right side if he makes some action he interacts with with his environment meaning as he made this action something happens think about you made a trade, something happens on the stock market, then you observe what happened and then you interpret it, right? So as you interpret it, you tell him, okay, this was bad or good. So reward is either negative, meaning bad, or good is positive. So you punish him for bad action, reward him for good action, and he goes again. Now, if we try to think about formally, what does, does this even mean? We know that there's something similar about jumping from states to actions to, to rewards in mathematics. And those are the MDPs, the mark of decision processes. So to formalize the MDPs and all this jumping from state to action, et cetera, et cetera, you know, it's, it's just basically a tuple of, of spaces where, where S is just a finite set of states, meaning where can we, where can we find ourselves selling, buying, trading, uh, options or, or underlines. Um, A is just actions, so finite set of actions. What can you do with it? Like, can you uh, trade it, buy it, sell it, hold it? T as a transition probability, uh, it's an operator that works on this set of S cross S, S cross A cross S, and that uh, outputs the values between zero and one. This is important because this is just a probability function, meaning it tells us how, what's the probability of, of, of our agent being in this state and doing this action of actually coming to a next state. R as a reward function, we need, it, we need some function, we need some way, formal way to tell our agent of, of whether something was a good decision or not. And finally, um, all these things together define, define our mark of decision process. And if we, if we say, okay, this is too dry, what does this really mean, right? So we saw these diagrams where you have these transition probabilities, you jump from place to place. And if you take this action, the probability, transition probability is that, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is like a very, very low level uh, uh, overview of mark of decision processes, but this is all we need to start formally thinking about reward meaning, meaning good or bad. Uh, state action etc and now as as we have this super uh, uh, simple example we can start thinking okay reward function what does this mean in the stock market how do i tell my agent something was good or bad states what are the possible states that when i make a trade i can find myself in meaning does this mean i am i lost a thousand i gained a thousand etc etc actions meaning what can i do with the options that i have can i hold them can i trade them can i uh, buy them right so you limit your space and then you can also extend it and say okay this space is not only hold buy sell it's also possible to leverage yourself so you can actually buy more than you have in your bank account etc cetera, etc cetera. so from this part on it's just taking your data and thinking how does this translate to this formal definition of market decision process and as i said oh, this was a little bit bad formatting but it doesn't matter uh, i won't go into details you already saw this formal definitions of states actions just basically a set that um just basically a set that formally defines what's an action, it's a, what's, a, what's an action, what's a transaction, a function, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have to go into details. It's maybe not interesting for, for a presentation. You can look it up online. Um, but what's actually more interesting is uh, the final part that I wanna talk about is policy after reward function. The policy also is built upon the market decision process and it's again a function. So it's all mathematical objects that gives us um, policy defines us actually what's what's our optimal way of acting in the given state with the given action hence you see the policy operates on s cross a uh, sets and 
and spits out uh, some probabilities between zero and one. And you see the very last line in this slide is probability of achieving, uh, of um, being of doing the um, action A given that you are in state S. And this is also a formal way of defining something that we want. So this is very bad formatting. Yeah. Um, um, so the next part that, that we need after policy function, I apologize for the bad format. I uh, converted this to a, to a, uh, to a PowerPoint from, from a lab tech uh, presentation. I, I, I can give you the lab tech presentation later on, and then you can see the formulas, but the formulas are maybe maybe not, not, not that, that interesting. It's the, the idea, the mathematical idea behind this. Uh, that's that's worth mentioning here. The the next thing that we need, and I guess that's the thought process that that motivates the different mathematical objects that we are defining here, is that okay? You have you have states, you have actions, you have transition, you have reward function, you have policy. But now what you need is a value function. You need some some formal mathematical object to give you the expected return that you would get when you perform under policy P and you're in state S. So that's just an expected value of RP, meaning reward in the state P, when you assume state S, right? So if you if we write this down, then we wouldn't get this shitty uh, formatting mistake that I had here, but it doesn't matter. It's all about the, the, the basic idea behind it that we want to maximize this expected reward function that we have uh, in this given state. And the other one is the state value function that says the same thing, the same thing, but not only in state S, but we also wanna see what's the expected value while taking action A in state S, right? So this, this is the only difference. So we have now another function state value function and state value function that just says us expected value of return given that you take state S and A. And that's it. If you write it out, it's super simple. Um, great. And what's what's the Bellman equation have to do with anything? Well, Bellman equation is just an equation, I guess, from uh, in stochastic, uh, stochastic control theory or, or dynamic programming that tells us how can we explicitly, meaning analytically, solve this value functions. So why do we even care about this? Well, if we have a Markov decision process and the policy P and the functions are satisfying the property four, um, the, 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 the function will satisfy the property four, we can explicitly say what's the value, what's the value of, of our value functions and state value functions if we find ourselves in state S. So if I were to put it in another terms, what we can say, and looking at it from the, from the point of view of, of uh, stock, right? What we can say is that if I find myself holding Tesla options, meaning I am in the state S, I can, I can see my expected reward if I tr sell them. That's a policy selling actions. Um, and what are my potential returns in this situation? So long story short, what, what Bellman equation gives us analytically is just exactly how much money can we expect by behaving in certain way and doing a certain action in specific state S. And that's the same for, for the value function equation four and the state function, the state value function in equation five. And now you can say, wow, if we can analytically say, meaning I can really say, calculate it right through the formula, I can calculate how, what's my expected return if I am in this and this position, then why do we need reinforcement learning in the first place? Well, there is a problem between the theory and the practical. In theory, the Bellman equation only is derived under certain assumptions. Um, certain mathematical assumptions that actually prove prove the the exact terms that that we just showcased in the equation four and five, but the reinforcement learning is just his counterpart where it represents the loosening of these ass assumptions and trying to find the optimal strategy, meaning maximize the return 
uh, for the agent under these uh, loosened conditions. So if we were to, to talk about it in other words, alternative is to find a pattern theta that would approximate the Q function. Meaning I need to find some statistical, uh, some statistical model that can approximate my Q function, meaning telling me what's my expected return when I use policy P, status and action A. And from here point, point on, it's basic statistical inference. What you need to do is to find the best theta so that the, that the loss is minimized between the true value of Q function and, um, and uh, that what you predicted. And this is very broadly what reinforcement learning is trying to battle with. Um, as I said, approximating is simple statistical theory. The, the more the, com the complexer your states are, meaning the, the complexer the environment that you're trying to model, take for example, stock market, the more, the, the deeper you need to go and the, the more complex the statistical theory behind it, it is. Hence, the deep reinforcement learning and using the deep neural networks to approximate this is a, is a valid solution because parsing through all this sea of data that, that's available in the stock market is hard and you need to, to go deep. And if you talk about what's these neural network and what's deep neural networks, et cetera, et cetera, it's again, just an algorithm. Uh, it's, it's a sequence of steps that can be reduced to mathematical equations and the core of these of this deep reinforcement learning is just backward propagation algorithm and if you google about it and you look about it a little bit you will see that's just analysis and mathematics behind making this computational efficient is linear algebra and numerical mathematics and that's it so if if we try to apply them we need to understand and to really understand the core of this is just linear algebra, matrix multiplications, and uh, numerical mathematics to make this uh, computationally efficient. Now, the fun part. Theory is great, but how do we actually deploy reinforcement learning? Yes, as I already mentioned, this is very computationally expensive. Um, you have to understand this huge ma matrix multiplications. We are talking about billions and billions and trillions of records that need to be multipl multiplicated with, with each other. So this is not feasible for normal machines. Hence, normal processor like CPUs are not, not available for us. So usually we have to go for GPUs, graphic processing units or TPUs, tensor processing units where they are optimized for these special kind of multiplications and the algorithms that use these multiplications. And hence, I, uh, I'm naming here one thing that I used and that's, that's really, really helpful. And we'll come to the next slide is using the cloud providers like AWS or Sage and, and, or GCP or, or other big players that offer you these computing services. Obviously, you have to pay for it, but usually uh, in, in startup con uh, context or research context in, in a university, you get free credits to use it. And you can use these big and expensive machines and do these simulations. And not only that, you can also use services that help you uh, specifically for these applied machine learning tasks, hence this SageMaker service for reinforcement learning. So what this allows you, and I, it's, it's been hugely helpful for me because I couldn't orchestrate this, this much servers and this, this, this much infrastructure to, to process this. It's, it's just a Python library that allows you to interact with the SageMaker uh, service, the software on the AWS, and it allows you to um, spin up the agent very easily, intuitively. You just have to read the documentation and understand uh, what does it mean, the entry point, meaning that's where you define your objective function, reward function, states, etc., etc. You program it down. This is, this is not, not, that, not that hard. Here you can also define how many instances, meaning the instance type, 
how big are your servers, your computing servers, the instance count, et cetera, et cetera. And why is this important? Because when you are done with your mathematical modeling, meaning you, you took your formal definitions and you translated it to something that you need to implement in software, this is usually, again, a huge task for non institutional uh, investors, people that are private and just don't have the time to build the huge infrastructure behind it. You, we need to leverage the tools available and not uh, reinvent the wheel from, from scratch. Um, so that's that's what I wanted to say. And now to the results and an example of backtesting the agent. And I just wanted you to show just one simple graph that showcases what, how does he be behave and what does he do? So obviously, when you build something like this, you're not going to go straight into, um, into trading. You really need to make sure that the something that you're going to invest your money in or, or try to invest and lose your money, that it actually makes sense. Uh, so back testing, uh, testing it on the historical data is hugely important. And here you see, but different training epochs, meaning the all the timestamps that he performed a certain trade and the trade was either buy, hold, sell, it was very simple, you see the reward function, meaning the amount of money that he earned. And just one D DQN profit is the, the agent, deep uh, Q networks. And you see just on the one uh, example here that he was uh, he was able to remain profitable for, for most of the time and uh, make make uh, additional additional money. Um, and this is also a very important uh, part that I want to figure out uh, is not really build something and then uh, make it mal malfunction in production. I really wanted to make sure that before it goes to production, it's tested and it really works good on historical data. Um, and I also wanted to, to tell you some, some personal anecdotes that was uh, that was problems while, while what I encountered while implementing this analyst. Feature space, too big and complex. What does that mean? Think about what's the data that you actually feed into your uh, reinforcement learning agent, right? So um, I already said it uh, shortly. It's the Twitter sentiments, text data, tabular data. But you have to imagine this data is huge. We are talking about millions and millions of uh, uh, rows and columns. This is very expensive and it's too complex to model. So one needs to also think about what's the most essential information that I need and nothing more besides that. Hence, because it's too big, it's too much computation time. You need too much, too many simulation rounds to tweak it. Um, also, there's mental bias to rely on some black box to guide you in a certain direction. You have to understand you are putting your hard earned money to to some decisions that some agent made, this could potentially cost you. So you are also always thinking, what am what am I relying on using some black box, uh, and am I potentially going to lose my money because I don't understand his decisions. He's saying to me he found some arbitrage, but why did that happen? And important thing, and that was the second slide I showed you, is you will still lose money. Like on that particular day, we lost a lot of money, and. Uh, I guess the good thing is he didn't lose it. He just suggested it. But still, you're uh, you're acting uh, with with something that's that's highly complex, and you really need to make sure that you understand it, like from the first principles. And that's why the whole discussion be, be, be behind the Bellman equation and MDPs, market decision processes, to really understand it from first principles. How is he operating? You just need these two mathematical concepts, and from there on, it's just implementation. Um, what can be improved to have an even better agent? As I said, this is really an R&D project, meaning research and development. There's a lot of papers and stuff that you can try and, and beat the benchmarks, et cetera, et cetera. And I just wanted to uh, name a couple of stuff that I did, uh, that I tried to improve it and, and make it better. It was data and feature engineering, meaning making sure that your data is really clean and informative before it even goes into the uh, algorithm time spent training and back testing. You need to really make sure that this is a tested and safe software because it's too much on the line. What I also did, you can, you can take multiple models and ensemble them, meaning you 
take different classes of algorithms, the A3C and policy-based ones. It's just in a category of algorithms. I don't want to go to two details and make it complicated. Long story short is that different reinforcement learning categories together can make more efficient results and combining them together we are ensembles can be very helpful. Also better assumptions around stochastic space. What does this mean? This means that how did we even model the, the set S or the set A? So what are the possible steps? Is this really what happens at the stock market? Are actions that we named sell, hold, and buy really correct? I mean, isn't there something more? This is too simple. So these are possibly either good or bad assumptions that can, that can make or break the whole agent. So uh, working around this is also very tricky because if you make it too complex, then you go into domain of quant hedge funds because you cannot build these huge softwares that there's hundreds and hundreds of software developers and quants that, that are building this. This has to be uh, small, but still informative enough. Then better statistical estimators and hyperparameters for the estimators, meaning when we approximate this state value function, we really need to make sure that we found the best weights to do this, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there are, there are so many corners that one can try and, and, and um, work on it uh, to enha enhance it even better. And I guess that's the whole point. It's an R&D project. This, this to really function, you will not find on some tutorial or somewhere online. You will find some, some weak versions where, um, where they promise they are making some thousands and thousands and whatever, but the, the, these are mostly, mostly actually pipe dreams. It's highly complex and it's an R&D project that involves a lot of time and it's, it involves a lot of effort. <clears throat> and I guess what I want to leave you with, and this is the final slide, is some key takeaways. Um, individuals cannot parse information anymore. Uh, this is just, this is an old concept where you can look at some data and analyze some charts and think you know something about the stock movement or option movement and parse some arbitrage. This is not realistic. In 2021, where you have these vast seas of information, this cannot happen. Use reinforcement learning to parse the information. Reinforcement learning can automate it, but what it actually does realistically is it aids in, in automation. And the key to understanding the reinforcement learning from the first principles in mathematics, and the key to implementing reinforcement learning is a lot of computing power. There, I advise you leverage already available solutions out there in regards of uh, cloud um, um, <clears throat> cloud providers and their their software. It can save you a lot of work implementing this, and you can then uh, actually use your time to think about modeling, to think about statistics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Finally, humans cannot have parsed the information reasonable time in 2021. That's that. So. I also want to leave some time if you have some questions. Uh, we can gladly discuss it now. If not, if you want to talk with me besides this, if you want to see the code, if you want to um, maybe discuss it furthermore, we can also connect, send me an email, connect, let's connect on LinkedIn and we can talk about it more, but also gladly. Mm -hmm.